Well, this morning, uh, we'll start with a prayer, but before we do that, um, we're looking at the helmet of salvation this morning and the sword of the Spirit. The last two pieces of armor um, that we're going to put on, and I, I like that guy up there, don't you? I mean, he looks a lot like me. <laughs> Except I don't have red hair. <laughs> Little red. I mean, isn't that a cool... I, I just an image uh, of the armor and uh, spiritually, I think what we look like when we face the enemy. I mean, how powerful we look, how strong we look, uh, and how God just takes care of us through every situation we encounter. Well, let's pray and just ask God's anointing and blessing on his word and uh, that uh, it'll apply to each one of us today. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you for our time of worship, our time of praise. Our time of thanksgiving, Father, and I just thank you for your love. Boy, how you just love us so much. You surround us and protect us with your ministering angels. I thank you that they are going before us and behind us and beside us. And as we venture out each and every day, we have our spiritual armor on, but we know it's by your power, by your grace, and by your mercy. We're just so thankful, Father, for everything you do for us. We should not and do not take anything for granted. Every breath we take, everything that we do, is by your grace and mercy. And we're just thankful for each day that you give us, each blessing that you flow our way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for this time together, this worship. Thank you for everybody that can be here today, everybody's watching on live streaming. We're just grateful and thankful, Father, as we gather together in your house today. Ask your anointing and blessing, Holy Spirit, come. Be our teacher, be our guide, and illuminate this word that not one word will fall to the ground, but will glorify God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and Holy Spirit, you as well. So we give you praise and glory and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so number one, the obvious one, is the helmet. It's the helmet. And as you kind of look at it, you can kind of see that it's, it's kind of leather and brass. They make the helmets in different things. Then they have a nice little plume or some kind of an ornament on the top as well. And it's very obvious the helmet is to protect our mind. It's to protect the head. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, when they go into battle from sharp blows, uh, not only with a sword, but it could be with a war club. It could be with anything. It's there to protect the head, right? And as we think about that, um, it's so vitally important because it's there to protect our mind as well. And we're going to talk about that. Um, my grandson, uh, Alex, he's just starting to ride bikes now. And um, one of the things that was, is required is a helmet. And you've got to wear a helmet if you're going to ride a bike. You're gonna, and so the helmet's to what? In case you fall down, it's going to protect your head. And so as we think about this helmet, think of it in terms of protecting us at all times. That helmet is to protect our mind, our thoughts, our memory, all these kinds of things that is vitally important to us. And as we look further into it, number two, the helmet of salvation. It is called the helmet of salvation. And number one, it is the place on our heads to remind us that our sins have been forgiven. You might want to underline that, that our sins have been forgiven and that we have been saved by God's wonder and grace. It's a reminder, and I think it's very important to know that our sins have been forgiven, and if you make a mistake, you mess up, Lord, forgive me, it's forgiven, and it's forgotten immediately. So as you're walking on your journey of life, and you in your own brain thinking, I should not have done that, Father, forgive me, he forgives you, and now he says, move on, move on now, all right? I'm going to protect your mind, I'm going to protect your thoughts, because you have to know your sins are forgiven all the time, and that God has come, he saved us, and also he has set us free. Not only has he saved us, but he has set us free. And so the importance of the helmet for you and I, it's the attack on the mind. It's plain and simple. I think we all know that. An example is, um, I don't know about you, but um, sometimes fear can creep in, and I talk about it all the time. I talk about it, and I chat with people all the time. What are you dealing with? Fear. What's your family dealing with? Fear. And yet, God protects us against that fear. We have nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear, right? He's given us eternal life. Sometimes doubts creep in our mind. Uh, worry creeps in our mind. But it all begins where? Up here. It, it, it's all in the brain. It's all in the head. It's all in the mind. And so this is another one that I, 
I, I'm always fascinated when I talk to some people that feel unworthy. They're saved, they're set free, and yet in their life, they still in their heart feel, I'm unworthy. And yet, how can that be? I don't know how anybody in the world that is a Christian can feel unworthy. Think about it. Jesus Christ died for you. To make you what? Worthy. To set you free, right? So why would anybody be fooled into thinking, I'm not good, I'm not this, I'm not that? Well, Jesus has set us free. But our mind will play tricks on us to deceive us and to bring us down rather than, as God wants to do, do what? Build us up. Build us up. And so as we look at this, it's important to understand the attacks always come, again, in part two. The helmet of salvation is to protect what? Our minds, as I've been talking about, and our thoughts, our thought life. Our thought life can be sometimes very positive, and sometimes our thought life can be very negative. And so we have to control that by putting on the helmet of salvation, controlling our thoughts all the time. And thoughts can come in, and uh, again, they can create doubts, fear, worry, frustration, or whatever. And the other thing that happens is all those things do what? They distract us from God Almighty. They are distractions from us loving God, worshiping God, serving God, and having fellowship with him. When things start goofing around in our mind, what does it do? It distracts us, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's a simple, simple tool of the enemy. It could be something big, it could be something small, but it's a distraction. And so we have to keep that in mind all the time, putting that helmet of salvation on every single solitary morning before you leave the house. Put the helmet on. And it's, um, again, what is important to me, it's a, it's a tool of distraction. If I don't have that helmet on, I, I can get distracted. Can any of you get distracted easily? <laughs> I mean, to tell you, uh, it's real easy. And uh, so God wants us to stay focused and not get distracted. And that's all up here, right? It's all up in our mind. And so 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says this, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And the enemy wants to put strongholds where? In your brain, in your mind. If he can control your mind, he controls you, right? It's, it's pretty plain. It's pretty simple. So we have to protect our minds all the time. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And this is very, 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 very important. I have it underlined. It should be underlined in your notes. And we take captive every thought to make it what? Obedient to Christ. We, you and I, have the responsibility of taking every thought captive and make those thoughts obedient to Jesus Christ. So if you will, we're usually in a very positive mode then. Our thinking is not negative, it's positive. All the wonders of God, the beauty of God. You look around and you're so grateful and so thankful for everything he's done. That's all in our mind, isn't it? And then it, and then it filters through our entire body and through the entire day. And so consequently, it's vitally important we take every thought captive. And I want only to have 2 Corinthians 2.16. I want the mind of Christ. I want the mind of Christ 24-7. Bill Hill is a nice guy, but he's not too bright. So I would rather have Christ's mind, not my mind. Are you with me? I mean, you're all smart. But Jesus Christ is what? Smarter. I'd rather have his mind, his thoughts functioning in our thoughts, right? So we have to put that helmet on. And we have divine power. We, you and I have divine power through the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And again, because we have the Holy Spirit and it's available to each and every one of us, ask that you receive the Holy Spirit, we have power to take every thought captive. We have power, wonder working power through the blood of Jesus Christ to take every thought captive and make it obedient again to Christ. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Um, short break. Uh, this morning, I decided to fast 
from news. I'm not going to watch it. I'm going to fast. I'm going to... Uh, I'm not going to go like Brian and Colleen. I think I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not going to sell my TV set. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to keep my TV set, but I'm going to watch Expeditions Unknown, Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives, uh, the all the Food Channels, all the History Channels, Exploring the Deep, anything but news. Right. So, I don't want to conform to the patterns of the world. And sometimes, if you get stuck in TV, you get stuck in the pattern. I don't care if it's a good, bad, or whatever pattern it is. You do not have to agree with me, but the patterns of the world will try to suck you in. They will try to do that. And let me tell you, it will change your feelings, your emotions, anger, frustration, and on and on and on and on. That's why we cannot conform any longer to the patterns of this world. But what? Be transformed by what? the renewing of our mind. And I don't think that's a once-in-a-lifetime deal. I personally believe I have to have my brain renewed all the time. All the time. And it is renewed in the mind of Jesus Christ. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Isn't that great? By allowing God to control our mind by putting that helmet of salvation on. And don't tell anybody, but put it on other people's heads too. <laughs> There's a couple people that you need to put it on their heads so they get some brains going, right? Some perfect thoughts. Now, number one, transformation says be transformed. Transform means a change of substance of character and conduct. And it becomes a radical change. When you have a transformation take place, it's radical. And there's a gigantic change that takes place in substance and in our character. And I, and I want to put this in conduct as what? Christians. We must be different. We must stand apart as Christians. And so our conduct and our character has to be different than that of the world. We cannot, cannot conform to it. We can't get into that pattern whatsoever. And A, a change of substance simply means things you can change by choice. When I have a, a change of substance, I make a decision to change things. And that's vitally important that we make a decision. It's a choice. We have a choice. I have a choice to smoke or not smoke. I have a choice to drink or not drink. I have a choice to watch TV or not watch TV. I have a choice to lay off of ice cream or eat bunches of it. It's all choices, isn't it? And they may be simple, they may be difficult, but we are filled with choices in life that we make. And then we are, oh, I'm not going to, we're the product then of our choices. I was going to say victim, but sometimes <laughs> the choices do that to us. So we have to understand that. And it's a, uh, we choose to do or not do something that is pretty simple. And then the renewing of our mind, uh, and all the time, the renewing of the mind changes from the inside, and then it goes outside. It's got to be the change inside, and then it goes outside. It changes our character, our conduct, and our lifestyle. All that by simply putting the helmet of salvation on. All the things I talked about just by putting that thing on daily and securing it and making sure it doesn't come off. Now, Roman numeral number three the sword of the spirit is God's living word. God's living word. And I read a story, and I may have shared it five, six, seven, eight years ago, but it was an interesting story about a guy named Ali Hafet. And uh, this guy was a, a Frisian farmer, and he sold all of his property. He had acreages. He had beautiful property. He sold his home, all of his possessions. And he started off traveling around the world to try to discover diamonds. He just had this passion for diamonds. Sold everything and searched basically country after country trying to find diamond fields, trying to find diamonds. And so he, he died eventually in a foreign country. He was broke in poverty and everything. And so shortly after that, uh, they discovered the famed diamond fields of Galgotha. And it's, I, I, I mean, Galcota. Pardon me, Gal 
Dakota. And they were the, they're the diamond fields in that area that all the base, basic diamonds came out of that. And I, guess what? That was all his property. The diamond field, this is a true story. This is a true story. And that uh, the diamond fields in, uh, in his area of, uh, I guess it was Persia, they found the richest vein of diamonds. And what it, I guess what that tells me and the, the importance of the story is you and I have the word of God. It's like precious diamonds. Right? The word of God is like precious diamonds. You open it up, it gives you information for the day, information to solve problems. And yet people go searching every place else but the word of God for the treasures of life. They search for everything. I thought, boy, what a interesting uh, story because people look elsewhere and that you and I have the word of God every day to read it, to understand it, to encourage us, to bless us, to lead us, to guide, to direct us. Open it up. Read the Psalms. Read the Proverbs. Find a verse and let that verse speak to you. And yet many, many people go elsewhere to get information about life. And yet everything about life is in the word of God. Amen? Everything. That's the sword. That's the sword of the spirit. That's power. That's power of almighty God. Now let me give you some examples. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. So the word of God is you and I. It's our source of truth. The word of God is our source of truth. People will give us their opinions. They'll tell us what our political position should be. They'll tell us right from wrong. People have all these different views and everything else. I want to know the truth, and the only place I can actually find the truth is in the Word of God. I do trust people. I mean, I, I, I trust people. I trust their opinions. But the basic truth is it comes from the Word of God. When I want to know right from wrong, is this right or is this wrong? And I've already mentioned this several times about Young Life's new group of people trying to move Young Life. And I have nothing against homosexuality. They can come, lesbians, gay guys, I, they're welcome at the Lighthouse Four Square Church. Everybody's welcome. That sign says everybody welcome, right? But there is a line I personally draw as a pastor, they can't be in any kind of service. They can attend, but not be in any kind of leadership. And so Young Life now is fighting of having gay and lesbian leaders in Young Life. And I've said this about four or five different times. Well, to me, if they're Christians, they ought to read the Bible and do what the Bible tells them to do. Not what pressure, not what being politically correct or going along with the crowd or any of this nonsense. What does God's word say? That's how we must live. That's the truth. That's the sword. That's the power. Not society. I'm not going to stand before in front of a bunch of people, I'm going to stand before God Almighty. That's who I'm going to stand before on Judgment Day. Nobody else. So it's important to you and I. We know the truth. We know the truth about God, life, death, morality. E every single thing is in the Word of God. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the Word of God and do what? Obey it. So the Word of God is our source also of happiness. You read the word of God, it brings happiness and it brings blessing. God's word will do that as you open it up. As you read it, it will bring you happiness. It will bring you blessing. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn babes, crave pure milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So the word of God is our source of food for growth. If you want to grow spiritually, be in the word. Then Read it and then do it. If you want to grow spiritually, you must be in the Word of God. You have to be in the Word of God. And it's like, um, you know, food is the source for everything. You know, you can eat a bunch of food and actually lose weight. You can eat a bunch of food and gain weight. You can gain muscle mass. But food is our source of what? Energy? Everything through carbohydrates. So we have to eat food, and now we have to stay stable and strong in our spiritual walk what? through the Word of God. That's our spiritual growth. Psalms 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So what does that tell you and I? 
The Word of God is our source of guidance. It's our source of guidance. It's our source of direction. It's the source of what we should do, should not do, all of that. It guides and directs our very life, the Word of God. Not only is it powerful, but it's our guide. And again, Romans 15, 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, isn't that interesting, the two words? You've got to have endurance, and then comes encouragement. You've got to keep going, 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 and going, and pressing on, and pressing on, and pressing on. And we do that through the word of God. Then we get an encouragement through the word of God. We get our strength. We get our source through the word of God. And number five, the word of God is our source of hope and comfort. Hope and comfort comes through the word of God. I think it's nice when people give you an encouraging word. But boy, when God's word speaks to your very heart and in the depths of your spirit, it's something else. Absolutely something else when God does that. And you open it up and go, whoa, this is uh, my hope. This is my comfort. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, all of it, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's interesting because people don't like to be corrected. You know, uh, I have a habit of slaughtering the English language. Uh, I'll, I'll say something and I'll pronounce it and my wife will say, honey, no, that's not, it. you pronounce it this way or you pronounce it this other way. I pronounced somebody's name the other day and I was corrected by some third party. No, no, you're from the Midwest. You, you, you're from the South. You don't say it that way. You say it this way. We're in Washington now. I thought, are you kidding me? Now, this happened to me a few days ago. And I thought, what do I care? <laughs> you know, you guys understand me. I, I hope you understand me. So anyway, uh, you got to handle that rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Number six, the word of God is for our protection. The word of God is to protect, protect you and I spiritually. To protect us in spirit, soul, and body. The word of God will do that. When we look at it, we read it, and we apply it. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates either to dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Think about that just for a minute. It judges the thoughts and the actual attitudes of my heart. The word of God will do that. That's powerful. That's incredible. And you and I have that sword of the spirit in our hands daily. It's there for you and I daily to have. The word is powerful. The word of God is absolutely powerful. And I wrote down a couple things um, on how I think the word of God is powerful. And the first thing that it did for me was it, take, it had taken me from darkness to light. The word of God takes you from darkness and brings in light. It takes you from sin and death and brings you into what? Righteousness. Into righteousness. The word of God is so powerful, it can change sadness into joy. That's how powerful the word of God is, taking sadness into joy. And it can bring you from despair into hope. Think about these things. That's how powerful the word of God is and how it can just transform you and I. And from stagnation to growth, that's a cool thing that we can grow. Um, it's interesting, and, and growth is a process, I will tell you. Um, I started, I, I mentioned this to you before, but to me it's kind of important. Um, I was able to start working out again um, uh, about, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, about two weeks ago I was able to start working out. And um, you talk about stagnation. You shrink <laughs> I was finding wrinkles I never knew I even had. I mean, they're all over my body. And my body had just kind of went like that. And so it is a process from stagnation to get back, quote unquote, in shape, right? It is a process. And so I thought about that. I thought, wow, from stagnation to growth. And sometimes it, 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 it's absolutely, and this is very important, it is a process. It is not instantaneous. It is a process that takes place. And from children or childlikeness to maturity, and this is very important too, the word of God will take us from failure to success. It will take us from failure to success. 
I could go on and on and on, and you could too with other illustrations, but that is the power of the Word of God, and it causes us to grow spiritually uh, in every, every, actually every facet of our life. It's wonderful, isn't it? So what we need to do is remember to put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit with you every single solitary day, the Word of God, because it will encourage you, it will bless you, it will strengthen you and cause you to grow spiritually. We can't let it fall to the ground, can we? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for uh, the series of um, the riches we have in Jesus Christ, all the riches you give us. And Father, as we look at that, we also see, Father, we're so grateful and thankful for the armor that you give us, the spiritual armor that we can put on each and every day. If we can gird our loins with the truth, if we can put on that breastplate of righteousness, take the shield of faith in our left hand, the sword of the spirit in our right, place upon our feet the gospel of peace, and Father, upon our heads the helmet of salvation to protect our mind, our thoughts, our memory, our recall, and that we have the mind of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, and thank you for this beautiful day, this time together. Boy, I'll tell you, Father, it feels so good to just come together with other believers and be in the house of God. There's just, there's nothing, nothing, nothing like that is to be together. Thank you for that, Father, and I ask your blessing on each one here. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. amen.